The House is expected to vote on legislation today that would authorize the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund through 2090. The vote comes one month after an emotional testimony from activist and comedian John Stewart along with 9-11 survivors Luis Alvarez, one of the first responders who pleaded with Congress to extend the funding, died just weeks after appearing before the House Judiciary Committee. The Victim Compensation Fund is expected to pass easily. It has 332 co-sponsors, including New York Congressman Sean Patrick Maloney. On Twitter, he called on the Senate Majority Leader to immediately bring the legislation to a vote, saying in part, anything less is a dereliction to do of duty to the American heroes who sacrificed everything to keep us safe. Congressman Maloney joins us now from Capitol Hill to discuss today's vote. He currently serves on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, as well as the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Great to have you, sir. Good to be with you. What has been the holdup on uh, passing this legislation to make sure that this fund is permanently funded? Look, it's absolutely critical that we get this done and we stop treating it like just another bill. It's not just another bill. It's not just another program. It's not just something else that can be kicked around like some political football the way it was the last time it was reauthorized by the Republicans. This is a sacred duty. You know, in my part of the world, this is not some abstraction. You cannot go to a community in the Hudson Valley that has not lost neighbors and friends on 9-11 and in the years since. This is, not a, this is not just another th thing. This is a sacred duty to the people who were there when we needed them most. Guys like Rafael Nieves, who's a retired NYPD police detective who's from Orange County, New York, in my, in my district. You know, he was assigned the duty to go work on that pile day after day. The compensation fund is what's going to help him lead a healthy life. And when he's, when he's battling illnesses contracted through that heroic service, we're going to stand with him. We need to get it done, and, and Mitch McConnell needs to get out of the way on this and do the right thing. Congressman, what are the next steps after the legislation is expected to pass today? How soon can the Senate take up this legislation and we can get these people the funding that they deserve? Well, you know, what are you asking me for? I, I think yeah. you ought to ask Ms. <laughs> Mitch McConnell what is more important than this. And look at what they did the last time. The, what they did the last time is they held it back and used it as a bargaining chip. I think that's disgusting, frankly. And I think, I think folks like you ought to go to Mitch McConnell's office and say, why isn't it already done? Why isn't it done yesterday? Why are you going to wait until the fund expires? Are you going to make these heroes come back down here one more time and beg you and sit in front of some congressional committee again? That's outrageous. The reason we're reauthorizing it to 2090 for 70 years, 7-0, is so they never have to worry about this again. They shouldn't have had to worry about it this time because right. when the Republicans had, had an opportunity to do the right thing last time, they did it for a couple of years. Why? Let's do it essentially permanently, which is what we're doing, so they never have to worry about it again. And, and you ought to put that question to Mitch McConnell. Congressman, next week looks to be a big one uh, over there in the House. You've got uh, Mr. Mueller coming to testify, long awaited. What do you want to hear from him? I want to hear a couple of things. First, I'm very interested in the meeting between Paul Manafort and Kalimnik. Uh, we know Kalimnik has ties to Russian intelligence. We know they gave him detailed polling data. I don't understand why a Russian oligarch who works with Russian intelligence needs polling data on an American presidential campaign, except to guide the massive social media campaign that we know existed. So I want to understand, uh, I want to understand more about that. It's covered in the report, but only in a cursory fashion. I think it deserves a lot more attention. I also want to understand from Director Mueller why he never insisted the president uh, give testimony under oath, in person. That's the historical precedent. That's what happened with Bill Clinton. I don't know why he broke with that precedent. I think he should answer that question for the American public. And then to more be... broadly, we just need to hear from the director what his findings were, because they have been mischaracterized by the attorney general. And I don't think the American public fully appreciates the gravity of what is in the Mueller report he should, he should be there in front of Congress, in his own words, restating it. To be clear, Congressman, do you believe that there was coordination between the Trump campaign and the Russian government? Well, look, we know there was all kinds of activity where the Russians were, were engaged in a, system, a systematic and sweeping effort, those are the words of the report, to help the Trump campaign. We know the Trump campaign welcomed that assistance and, and, and was willing to use it. Whether they actively criminally conspired, the attorney, uh, excuse me, the, the, the special counsel has told us he found no evidence of that, and I accept that finding. 
But that does not mean there aren't still serious questions that we need to ask. That's Congress's job, to do oversight. There's an mm -hmm. enormous national interest on this. And by the way, on the Intelligence Committee, we're, we're concerned with much more than just whether crimes were committed. We're worried about the, the, the counterintelligence problem. We're worried about foreign influence. You know, when, when, a, when, a, when a Russian oligarch with ties to Russian intelligence is, is offering financial inducements to the campaign manager for a major, major presidential campaign, when they are financially entangled with deals like Trump Tower Moscow, these present serious foreign influence questions that are more than just a criminal question, and that's the oversight responsibility of the Intelligence uh, Committee, to find so out what the national security threats are to the United States. Congressman, what are you going to do, though, if the special counsel comes and he just reads from the report? I mean, a lot of discussion around this has been he's really just being called before Congress because people didn't like that the Mueller report didn't get enough attention for the Democrats, and that's the purpose of him being called before you. Well, uh, flip it around. I mean, let's mm -hmm. pretend that after two years and millions of dollars, hundreds of interviews, you know, hundreds of subpoenas, all of the work and attention paid to this by, by folks in the media, that Congress didn't ask a single question of the special counsel. I mean, I think that would be a dereliction of our duty. I mean, for one thing, you know, it, it is important that, that the special counsel appear before the people's representatives in public session and answer some basic questions. Now, look, I understand that he's going to want to stand behind his report, and I think it's appropriate that he, that he not engage in speculation or opinion making the way Jim Comey did, which was a mess. So I respect the integrity of Bob Mueller. I respect his desire to stand behind the factual findings in the report. But it doesn't mean there aren't questions, and it doesn't mean there aren't things he needs to answer for. Mm -hmm. As a member of the Intelligence Committee, have you seen any evidence that you could tell us about anyway that China is looking to follow in Russia's footsteps here and also get involved in our elections? Well, I'll tell you, I'm very worried about the great power competition between the United States and China. And when we're done chasing our tails on the individual aspects of the Russia investigation and when the partisanship on this is over, we are going to hopefully have a united bipartisan approach to the strategic long-term challenge that is China. I don't see any evidence that China is actively trying to interfere in our elections the way we know the Russians have. But let's bear in mind, you know, the state of New York has a bigger economy than the country of Russia, right? Apple Corporation has a bigger market cap than Russia. Uh, ultimately, Russia is not our long-term strategic competitor. China is. And the Chinese have a long-term plan to displace us as the preeminent military and economic power in the world. And a lot of us aren't going to let that happen. And we can do it in a bipartisan fashion. I'm very interested in a long-term strategic approach to countering China. One last question for you, sir. On presidential politics, you are an early endorser of Beto O'Rourke. Why do you think he's the right choice? Uh, because I've seen him inspire millions of people. I, I know him as a close friend. I know his family. I know what's in his heart. He's decent. He's honest. He's in this for the right reasons. He's smart. He understands policy. Uh, he can represent the entire coalition that is the Democratic Party. And I think he'd be an outstanding president. And he'd also allow us to move forward um, you know, with, a, with, a, with a new president that is, all due respect, not from the baby boom. That is someone who is uh, from a new generation and who can lead the country hopefully in a direction of greater unity and greater, and greater, greater positive inspiration around, uh, around the values we all share. That's who we have been before. That's who we can be again. I think Beto can do that. So, Congressman, have you been giving him any advice because he's not doing so well in the polls? Oh, this is, a, this is a marathon, not a sprint. I think you guys do this ticky-tack, everyday thing. It's a long way to the first people are going to vote. I think everybody ought to calm down and realize that there is, there's essentially a lane here for somebody who's not the vice president, um, who represents a new generation, and who can represent the whole coalition of the Democratic Party. And there's some competition for that. We have some great choices, great choices in this Democratic primary process. Um, so I think he'll have his shot. I think he's well positioned. I think he's done well on, on the box score of things you care about in a race like this. Uh, I, I wouldn't count him out yet. All right. Well, thank you so much, Congressman. Thank we you, appreciate Congressman. It. My pleasure. Coming up, the 2020 Democratic primary is now officially a horse race. And different polling reveals vastly different rankings for the frontrunners. Team Rising is next. They will have obviously different opinions when we continue.